And I'm, I'm going to talk about movement disorders, which is, you know, to me, it's the most interesting of the um, neurologic specialties, at least in the sense of treatments that are available. And I'll show you multiple examples of this. Um, and where a patient is having a problem with movement is it's either too little or it's too much. In Parkinson's disease, there is a deficiency of, a dop uh, of dopamine, which is a chemical in the brain, a neurotransmitter which is required for normal movement. And um, what we do in Parkinson's disease is that we replace the dopamine using medications. So this is um, 50 years ago, before the advent of levodopa treatment. And you, you can see from the statistics that um, you know, many people were disabled or dead within a sh relatively short space of time um, after having Parkinson's disease in the absence of um, effective treatments. And over the years, we have had an increasing array of medications that we can use um, to treat Parkinson's disease. But most of them still rely on this principle of replacing dopamine within the brain. Um, some of the formulations may be more convenient. So for example, over here, there is a patch that can be applied once a day um, instead of medications taken multiple times um, each day. Parkinson's disease, you know, there's, a, there's an epidemic um, upon us. This is a, an age-related condition, just like Alzheimer's disease, osteoarthritis, you name it. These conditions which are related to age are becoming more and more frequent. Um, and what we see in the clinic is probably just the tip of the iceberg. 40% of these elderly individuals had pathology um, suggestive of Parkinson's disease that would presumably um, become manifest if they had lived long enough. Okay. The treatments that we have currently are not without limitations. Levodopa has this um, inadvertent side effect in some patients who, when they take medication, it works and their movement improves, but it overshoots and they have excessive involuntary movements. So in the past 20, 30 years, we have had some um, significant advances in treating these problems. So for example, this is a procedure called deep brain stimulation surgery where um, our neurosurgeon inserts a fine wire deep into the brain, um, as you see here. So th this is a battery, and it's connected to a fine wire under the skin, and it goes deep into the brain. It modulates the abnormal electrical activity that occurs in, in, the, sub in the subthalamic nucleus, or the STN, and it results in a profound improvement in symptoms. And this is the difficulty that we face now um, in this field, and I would argue that it's relevant not only to Parkinson's disease, but in fact, you know, to the whole gamut of degenerative diseases. So here you see staining for alpha-synuclein, which is an abnormal protein that accumulates in the brain cells of people with Parkinson's disease. This is the underlying reason why people with Parkinson's, even if they've had successful treatment of their movement problems over time develop problems that become refractory to treatment. For example, dementia, psychosis. And this, this comes back to this um, concept of um, Parkinson's disease being, being a multi-system widespread disease affecting not only that part of the brain which is lacking in dopamine, but affecting many other parts of the brain and in fact, the spinal cord and the peripheral autonomic nervous um, system as well. In rec recent years, there has been a lot of um, interest in the possibility of interfering in some way with the spread of this protein throughout the brain. Okay? This would be the, you know, the holy grail of um, treatment for Parkinson's and related conditions. But what triggers this? Probably like most diseases, be it diabetes or you know, anything else you can think of, it's going to be a combination of both genetic factors as well as environmental factors, but precisely which we don't know. At um, UM, we have been um, interested, for example, looking at one aspect of this, which is potentially the role of um, altered gut bacteria, the gut 
uh, the micro human microbiome um, in setting up a situation where the abnormal proteins can um, accumulate in the gut and then travel up the connection between the gut and the brain, which is the vagus nerve, and then it starts up in the brain. We get asked this question every day. What about stem cells? And, you know, a lot of this is hype, unfortunately. Um, there's a lot of promise, potentially, but based on what I've just told you about the widespread nature of Parkinson's disease, would you expect a treatment that replaces certain cells deep in the brain, let's say dopamine-producing cells, would that solve the problem of Parkinson's disease? It would not, because there are multiple cell types that are involved. I'd like to move on um, to another topic, um, which is patient-centered care. And this is, this is care that, um, um, that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient needs and preferences. You know, with respect to um, developments in digital technology, um, a, a lot of ways that can improve the delivery of medical care. You know, you can see a patient who is six hours away um, without them necessarily having to come in physically. And, and of course, physically, many of these patients are having difficulties, you know, with their mobility. And, um, and this is providing care via um, a video link. Certainly, I think, you know, we are moving towards this. I myself find um, electronic communication in the form of emails extremely useful um, with, with patients, and, and especially in a condition like Parkinson's disease where there is so much variability in the treatment response. When you ask your doctor that question, what would you recommend? The doctor may not be thinking about you necessarily. They may be thinking, you know, about something else. Oh, I have a quota to fill. This medication needs to be used. All right, I know this sounds terrible, but as I said, you know, doctors are, are only humans. And I think as much as you can, you want to try and frame things to your advantage. So instead, in, ask instead, what would you do if you were in my shoes? Now, I don't think that would be, you know, confrontational to, to most medical practitioners. These are also cases of dystonia. So dystonia is where there is an abnormal overactivity of muscles because of a brain dysfunction. So these patients, right, there's a lot of eye blinking, eye closure, okay? And this is her after treatment with Botox. Botox is not just used for cosmetic. In, in fact, it's been used for medical purposes for more than 30 years. These are, you know, opportunities to uh, speak and to uh, make new friends uh, around the world and um, I uh, want to pay um, homage to my mentor uh, in Toronto, Professor Anthony Lang, whom you see over here, um, who, who taught me a lot of these things uh, when I was in Toronto. We hold this once a year to say thank you to the patients who have taken part in our research. We have awards given out for fastest walker, best uh, cognitive performance, Oldest patient, youngest patient, anything we can make an excuse for to appreciate the patients who, you know, for clinical research, without the patients, you can't do anything. I recall reading a paper that you wrote concerning pneumonia being one of the key factors in Taiwan where people with Parkinson's kind of, it's like the end stage thing where it happens to them. It, does it mean that some of their uh, inspiratory and uh, expiratory muscles in their breathing capabilities is uh, compromised at those stages? Parkinson's disease is a progressive disease which is incurable. And so over time, patients become significantly disabled. And, and the commonest reason for uh, patients to die um, with Parkinson's disease is from a chest infection because they can't swallow well. And if you can't swallow well, sometimes food, even saliva, instead of going down into the stomach, goes into the lungs and it causes what's called aspiration pneumonia. 
So, you know, this, this is, this is a, a very common um, type of problem that we face in patients with very long-standing Parkinson's disease. Professor Lim, just a question. Uh, can you comment on whether diet or food sources have anything to do with Parkinson's, potentially? Interestingly, um, consumption of caffeine is associated with a lower risk of developing Parkinson's. But is this an association or is this a causal relationship? We don't know for sure. But this has been repl replicated now by a number of studies, epidemiological studies, um, showing a lowered risk. On the other hand, and I say this very tentatively, smoking is also associated with a lowered risk of developing Parkinson's. <laughs> now, don't go out of here and, and start lighting up, because obviously smoking has you know, all the issues with cancer and heart disease, stroke, blah, blah, blah. But interest, interestingly, and, and some people have even suggested that um, these effects may be mediated through the gut by altering, um, you know, the composition of gut bacteria. I, I don't know. Well, the sites have also been linked um, to, to the um, development of Parkinson's disease. But, you know, if you look at these studies, the odds ratio is about two. So that means you know, the in increased risk is from a 1% rate to 2%. So it hardly explains, you know, the vast majority of cases of Parkinson's.